Hi everyone, this is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today we have with us a guest who during Bible study shot up like a ball into heaven or into space and saw something beautiful. When she told her pastor, he didn't completely believe her. After that, she had an attack and left her body and she's here to share her experience with us today. Rhonda Delamore-Neary, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Tell us, how did you even start off on your journey of being a Christian to begin with? I was very, very, very lost. And I was pregnant at the time with my oldest daughter, um, um, Faith, who's now 20. And But at the time, I had a son who was five years old. And <laughs> this is really embarrassing, but... I had, um, I was married to someone who had um, got, who had been in prison and was very abusive. And, and sadly, we had been married for four years, during which time I was just completely lost and making so many bad choices. And, but whenever, whenever he got out of prison, I kept, <laughs> so many people told me not to marry him, but I kept thinking, oh no, I he's going to change and all of this. And so there was this moment when, whenever he and I had been fighting and I was hiding behind the bathroom door um, in our apartment in California. And all of a sudden I looked down at my son's eyes and he look, was looking at me and his eyes were so afraid. And I was like looking at him right next to my pregnant belly. And I don't know how to explain it, except that I just like felt like I just woke up all of a sudden. And I remembered my own childhood. I had been abused a lot and been through a lot of abuse and neglect as a child. And I remember being afraid all the time. And it was like something just clicked. And I realized I was doing my kids, my son and my baby potentially in the womb. If, if I didn't get out of the situation, I'd be doing the exact same thing, putting them through exactly what I went through as a child. And I just woke up and, and all of a sudden I realized I was the one to blame. Like I didn't know what I was doing with my life and I didn't know how to live. And, and it happened very quickly. I just realized I needed God and I needed an escape from myself because I was the one who was making all these choices leading up to this moment. And so at that moment, I felt all of a sudden like an urgency to call my boss, who was the one person I didn't want to know any of, the, of this was going on. I, I very much perfected putting a mask on when I went into the world. Um, I had, Professionally, I had it together. If you looked at me, I looked like I had it together. But inside, I was a complete wreck and could not make one right choice to save my life. And my children in my life were suffering the consequences of that. And so at the, the moment I decided to call my boss, it was like God just started immediately directing my path. And I knew it was Jesus who was helping me instantly. Like in an instant, I, I acknowledged that I needed him. And he was right there showing me what to do to take the next step. And my boss um, came with her brother. And from that day on, they, they moved me into... Uh, her sister's home where I could be safe and they helped me in every way just get back home and get a brand new beginning and I just from that day forward I started walking with Jesus and he's just giving me this supernatural longing for his word and to know him and it's it's been like that all ever since then so how did you even come to know about Jesus well when I heard I was a child my mom would she took did take us to church a few times and um and I remember like um hearing about him in church and then I also there were there were just people like divine appointments that people put in my path like friends that I met at school I had one friend when I was um in, in 11th grade that uh invited me to church camp with her and while I was at church camp with her it was like everything I was hearing was exploding in my heart and I knew, I knew that at that time that like Jesus was real and I would have thought I got saved at church camp, but I'm, I'm not really sure because I, as soon as I got back home into that same environment, I went back right into the mess that I was living in. And I, I stayed that way. It, it wasn't until 13 years later that this experience behind the bathroom door happened. And so 
I knew, I felt like Jesus was drawing me to him. I, even as a child, whenever I was a, a very young child and I was actually being molested, um, I always felt, it sounds weird, but the sense of protection over me. I didn't even, I was more aware of the protection over me from the war than I was even of what was happening to me physically. And so I feel like that Jesus was present with me all along. I just, it was like all this, this stuff was, in, was happening in my life that would contradict who I believed him to be and who I was hearing he was. And so it was like this battle in my heart and my mind over who's going to win, Jesus or, or the everything I was seeing in my life that was so much brokenness and, and evil. But it, there was the time when I just finally let Jesus in and I started walking with him. And my life has never been the same since then. Rhonda, I know you mentioned that uh, you married or dated multiple men from prison. Do you think that has to do with your childhood and what you went through? Yes, I, I believe that, and I became a counselor, I think because of my background from my childhood, I know it has to do with that. And the reason, the best way I know how to explain this is because when I was a little girl, I, I experienced so much um, re fear of rejection uh, because of just not have, I guess having, my parents love me and I know they, they do. And my mom is amazing. Like she raised five kids by herself, but to do that, she had to work all the time. So that left the door open for lots of bad things to happen that should not have happened. And I don't blame either one of my parents for that. However, it did happen. And because of that, I feel like I had this propensity to enter into relationships that where people were not emotionally available. And so when I would <laughs> inevitably end up with men who I would, I would say in my heart, I was making a strong commitment to, but they were people that were completely unavailable to me and uh, to my heart. And that was because that was the only safe place I felt like I could have a real relationship with someone who was not really there, available for me. It's completely opposite of what we have in Christ, which, which is just this opportunity to really be real with people. And there's no mask needed because you're completely free to be vulnerable with people and especially in relationships with close friendships and with um, romantic relationships. But yes, the, I definitely think that that was um, the case, like the men that I, I would date nice men, but I always felt a sense of lack of insecurity around them because I knew how broken I was. And so it was like, I would pick the people in my life who I felt I deserved. And I felt so unworthy of love and so unavailable, like afraid to truly be seen and known that I would pick people who kind of matched my uh, brokenness. Well, Rhonda, let's talk about the lion's bones. You told me an interesting story about the lion's bones. So tell us about that. This was right after I got saved. It's kind of funny, but I, I came back, I started a whole new beginning and I started just having this amazing hunger and thirst for God's word, the Bible, but I did not know how to study the Bible. I had tried to read it before this moment happened in my life and this encounter with Jesus happened. And before becoming saved, and I would inevitably just couldn't understand it. But all of a sudden, it was like I could understand what the Bible was saying, but I did not know where the books of the Bible were. I did not know there was an Old Testament or New Testament. I was like brand new to God's word. But um, so that was, I give you that background to explain what happened. Um, at the time I came back and I started a whole new beginning, I'm still pregnant with my daughter and I had this, uh, I kept asking and praying God, like, God, please help my, uh, my marriage, even though it was a very unhealthy marriage, I did not know whether God wanted me to get a divorce, which did not seem, it did not gel with what I was hearing from God's word or um, what, what he wanted me to do. And so I was really seeking him. This was the first real big prayer that I was praying um, after becoming a Christian. And while I was asleep one night, still pregnant, um, I had this dream. And in my dream, I, I fell asleep and um, 
And when um, all of a sudden I'm like this, now I'm dreaming. I'm like, I'm sitting up in my bed and I'm, and I'm realizing my, um, in, in my dream, my daughter was already born and I hear this roar, like this roaring breathing coming towards us. And we're in this two story house. Um, and I can hear these footsteps coming up the stairs. And I look at my son and I say, I, I'm, I tell them, I tell him to take my daughter and go into the bathroom and whatever they hear, do not come out. Whatever you do, do not come out of the bathroom. And, and I shut the door. I tell them to lock it. And then, uh, and I get a baseball bat and I'm like standing ready. Cause I know there's a lion coming up these stairs and he's getting ready to attack me. And, um, and I'm going to try and protect my children. So this is all in my dream. So next thing you know, still in my dream, but, and I guess in my dream, it was kind of a dream within a dream. I, I open my eyes and I hear the, this lion purring and I look down and this lion is like, has totally devoured me and there's nothing left in my body. I'm just bones. And so all of a sudden, um, I, in my, when I, it was like, I was alive, but there was no part of my body left. And he was like purring and looking at my bones. Like he was so happy. And all of a sudden I, I alerted and I was like, oh my goodness, if he did this to me, what's he going to do to my children? And I, and at that, I woke up from the dream and I, with these words in my heart, like so loud, first Peter five, eight. And I was like, what does that mean? Is that even in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? And I grabbed my Bible just to see. And that moment sitting at the kitchen table in the middle of the night and opening and seeing that there, first of all, is a first Peter in the Bible and there is a first Peter 5, 8. And then when I read it, it said the lion prowls around, like um, the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And all of a sudden I was like, God's talking to me. Oh my gosh. I was so amazed that he talks to us so clearly and um, that's how he talked to me. And as soon as I read those words, I knew in my heart that it was like his voice was resonating saying, Rhonda, the, your, the enemy is using your ex-husband to devour you. He is using your ex-husband to devour you. And I knew at that moment that his will, even though he hates divorce, he, I had his permission to get out of that marriage because um, it was not what his plan lined up for me to be. Was that the first time God had ever spoke to you that you remember? No, I remember. Um, and I did not recognize this to be God, but when I was pregnant with my son, and this was when I was with the first guy who was in prison. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. It's so amazing what God does when he cleans up our life. But I was pregnant out of wedlock with this other guy that had, um, it was in prison at the time that I was pregnant with my son. And I mean, he was, he had taken everything. He had stolen my identity and just, I did, I had nothing except I was pregnant. And, um, and I, and I, and so there was a family that was going to already adopt my son. And, um, sorry, I'm going to get emotional when I talk about this because I, I knew this was God. And, and the crazy thing is, is he was talking to me, even though I was completely outside of his will and had no intentions of following his will. But when I was pregnant with my son and there was one day when I was just alone. I was hardly ever alone during this time because I was living at my mom's house. And I was like crying so hard because I just could not imagine giving him up for adoption. But I felt like I had no choice. I was, I had, when all this happened when I was a junior in college. And so I was, you know, it only had like a year left till I graduated with a degree. And so I felt like I was that close to being able to, to keep him, but I wasn't quite there yet. And so I was just crying so hard and just really, really in a not good mental state. And uh, all of a sudden I heard this voice saying, Rhonda, you can keep him. I'll make a way for you. And I was like, is that you God? <laughs> and it was like, I didn't, I heard it so loud right here. And it just came so loud and I knew, and all of a sudden I was like, I had hope. I had a hope and a strength that I hadn't had just minutes before. And, and I did, I graduated, I, I had my son, took him to school with me, college classes with me. 
and got back into my college I had uh, been in when I met that guy and um, graduated within a year and a half and had become a teacher. And so, and so he did make a way for me, but wow. I still didn't follow him until, until the event that I mentioned just earlier. Speaking of your ex-husband, I'm sure he's your ex-husband right now, was he the last person that you were dating from prison? And after that, what yeah. made you stop dating? Men? Was he, was he the last from prison? <laughs> yes, he was. Thank goodness of okay. all. And and so yeah, I didn't think I was a prison wife before that was a thing. And so <laughs> you would have been a one of those Lifetime or a TLC shows. Yeah, thank goodness. Otherwise, who knows? I may never <laughs> learn my lesson. But <laughs> yeah, that was the last, and that was the. And I'm in a crazy way. I'm thankful because it took a lot for me to see, to realize the truth of how broken I was because I, I was, because of my childhood, I mean, it, it was very broken, but I always learned to just pick myself up and, and, and keep going. And so I had this real independent spirit about me. And so um, it took a lot for me and I think it took me seeing that pain from my, in my, through my children that if, and knowing that, your independence is, is what's breaking you. And, and I need God. I need to know what it's like to be loved by a savior and to give up and, and literally have my life crucified with Christ so that I could truly learn to live following him and not figuring it out, but, but like trusting that he's got it all figured out. So Rhonda, let's go to where you were sitting in, I think it was a prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. And something happens in a prayer meeting yes. that had you... Always, some, something always happens when we pray. <laughs> I love it, I love it. And this time you actually saw what happens when we pray. You yeah. saw one instance. So could you just tell us about this one? Sure. What happened was, um, this was a little bit further along. My daughter had been born and I was still newly, I would say, you know, learning to follow Jesus. I had done my first Bible study but I knew there was something God was calling me to. And I had been invited to this weekend retreat. It, I believe it was called Breakthrough. And it was just a, a, a weekend where of intense prayer and intense, um, uh, I guess, confrontation with, with if, do we truly believe God's word? And so, and it was during this time where, um, I had another encounter, a very powerful encounter with Jesus that really changed my life. Um, and even when I knew it was possible with him, uh, and it's still, it's still in effect today, but what happened was, um, I had, I was at this prayer meeting. There was this time where we were just going to deep prayer where they were, um, they turned the lights down and they gave us an opportunity to just surrender and so for me, what happened was I had brought a pillow with me so I could pray and with my, in the posture of prayer, just with my head down on this pillow. And I was kind of in fetal position with my head on a pillow and I was just repenting. And I know the Lord was helping me know how to pray because I did not know really, I'm just learning as I go how to be a Christian and how to really even pray. But what happened was that I was in this time of prayer and I just started, it felt like the Holy Spirit was just directing me to ask for forgiveness uh, for my father, my earthly father. And, um, and so I just started, and it was like, I could see all these scenes of this stuff from my childhood. And, um, and I could just, it was like the pillow I had my head on kind of was like my dad and my dad was just stroking me. And I was just telling him how sorry I was and how much I repented from my own lack of, um, of, of my own response, taking responsibility for my own breakdown, my part in the breakdown of our relationship. And I was just weeping and just repenting and, and just telling him how broken I was and how, how sad it was to grow up and without him. And just like letting things that were coming out, it was like things were coming out of me that needed to be released that I didn't even know were there. And then all of a sudden it shifted and it was the same thing happening, but with my mom. And so uh, same thing, she was, I had my head on her lap and she's stroking me and I'm just weeping and saying how sorry I am for my own part in our lack of relationship. And 
and telling her how hard it was as a child and just just let releasing all the stuff that was in me that I had no idea was in there it was just buried so deep and then the next thing I know I have my head down and all of a sudden it in my in my heart and in my eyes it felt like Jesus I had my head on his lap and I was repenting to him for all the times I haven't believed him and haven't trusted him. And I told him all the lies I believed about him, that he wasn't there, that he didn't love me. And all of these things were just coming out and I could feel him just stroking my hair. And all of a sudden, when I'm in this encounter with Jesus, it felt like, um, and it was like I could see it. It was like it was really, really happening. Like I became this ball of light that just shot straight up into the air. And it's fast as lightning, like was zooming up through the atmosphere. And what I was feeling in my heart or what I was feeling in my whole body, it was unbelievable. Like, like if you were to take that moment in your life of the greatest joy imaginable and explode it times a million, that's what I was feeling. And I was like, I can't contain this. This is too much, but I'm going up through the atmosphere and I'm going through space. And, and there's all these other balls of light and I can't see myself, but I know what I look like because I'm seeing the others around me and, and, and they would come and bump into me. And every time they bumped into me, there would be an explosion. And I, that joy, I was like, psh, it was even more amplified and it was amazing. And I was like, I really did think like I knew enough. I had heard about the rapture. I thought that I'm being raptured. This is amazing. <laughs> Anyway, and so I had no idea what was going on and I didn't, it was like I completely earth with, you know, not even a, in my thoughts. I was just so caught up in this moment. And the next thing you know, I'm like flat as a pancake and I'm not a ball of light anymore. I'm in my body and I'm like this completely prostrate. And I know Jesus is right here, right in front of me. And I'm like, I'm so flat like I don't know how to describe it but there's a weight on me like I cannot move because the weight of the glory was so heavy on me that all I could do was just lay there but even when I'm laying there I'm so bathed in love and joy and peace that I would I could lay there for ever and ever and ever and ever and I would have been totally satisfied like that would have been completely fine with me and because I just felt like this is exactly what I'm made for. And so when I'm laying there in that moment, the, the other thing that's happening, and it's very hard to describe because it's sensations that I have never felt in this world, in this body. But my whole life up to this point is like, like a Rolodex right before my eyes. And I can see him seeing me. And um he can see everything and not just my, not just what's happened, but my thoughts about what has happened. And um, it was, it was really emotional because I felt him loving me the whole time, but yet I knew that I had not acknowledged him through all of it. And I had just lived my life completely based on my own understanding and, um, he was seeing that and all of a sudden he picks up this tiny thing like it's like like a piece of paper he pulls it out of me and he holds it in his hand and he says thank you and um and then I'm all of a sudden I woke up and I was back in my body and um it just really <laughs> really humbled me because I, I realized so much of my life had not been lived for him but yet he received, <laughs> he received what was and was taken. He wasn't, he, he had loved me through it all, but I had given him nothing, hardly, except for maybe just the knowledge that I needed him. And that's what he received out of my whole life. And it just broke me. And so from that, I, I've tried to live in such a way that, that I'm acknowledging him with my whole life from that moment. And that was a real blessing to me. Uh, when you say that you were laying prostrate before Jesus, where were you or where do you think you were? I have no idea. I think I was in heaven. I think I was before his throne and he was 
judging me. Um, but I was not aware. I, it was never like I looked up and looked around. I was, I was like seeing what he could see through my life. And I was hearing his voice. Mm. And I saw whenever he picked up, it wasn't like I saw him pick up, but I knew he pulled this little piece out of me. Mm -hmm. um, I never saw his face. I felt like I was right before his feet. Like, but I'm, I know, I don't know. It was, it's hard to explain. <laughs> and so, but it was, it was very, of all the encounters I've had in my lifetime, this one has really changed my, my, the whole trajectory of my life. It sounds pretty awesome. So you said before this, you had heard of the rapture. Were you even thinking of it when you were praying? Whenever I was going up into, into heaven is what I believe I was going up to. I, I was so unaware of everything. It was like the world was gone and all the, I was in, I was completely in this experience. And and so I don't know at that moment, I can't remember if I thought, I, rem I remember thinking like, I couldn't understand what was happening, but I remember hearing about the rapture. And so in my, I, I didn't, I wasn't really trying to um, intellectualize it or anything. I just knew like, whoa, I'm going up. I'm, and then whenever I finally landed, I knew I was exactly what I, where I was created to be be and who and I was with who I was created to be with and so um when I remember when I woke up from that whole experience I remember thinking oh I thought I was raptured <laughs> and then <laughs> and then all of a sudden I'm back here and it's kind of like wah, 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 you know <laughs> and so but um but yeah it was an incredible experience and so and I did I did hear of, of the rapture. My mom would tell me about it a little bit when I was a kid, but I had no concept concept of what it was. Uh, however, now that I look back on it, I, I'm like wondering, was that like what the rapture is going to be like? <laughs> and so it would not surprise me if that if that is what it's going to be like, although I don't know for sure. When you were shot up like a ball of light, were there a lot of balls of light that were people or were there some were there were there were I could not it was like looking into outer space but you're going super fast and there's everywhere you look there's other balls of light around you and so it was like there were a bunch and then because we were we would bump into each other and when we would bump in it was just an explosion of joy and but however when I was before Jesus it was like it was just he and I completely alone and so I can only imagine that you know I I I guess you know I, I never thought about it but I'm sure that if that did happen to other people that they would have been having that same experience like I did of having their lives reviewed at that time well you know what Rhonda it was really interesting how you said what you were doing right before this happened how you were laying on the floor, praying in a fetal position, and you surrendered yourself. And I think surrender is a huge thing. And then once you surrendered, you repented of all the unforgiveness that, that you had, as well as the unbelief. Right. And I think that's like, that's like a package, I feel like. It surrender, is. repentance, forgiveness, and repentance of unbelief i feel like that's like a, a really good package maybe. and i don't know that we know and i feel like god's taught me how to do that like he knows what surrender and repentance looks like and and i've learned a lot about that and nothing with him i haven't gone anywhere in my journey with him without exactly that formula that surrender repentance and and then believing him and he teaches us how to do this thing and um and to truly look for him he helps us but yeah that's exactly right there's a scripture that says um he who is bowed down shall speedily be released and there's another one that says in repentance and rest is our salvation and quietness and trust is our strength and so there's this this amazing gift we have of of being with Jesus when we just let go and realize that he really is the Lord. Like he's the Lord and he's got us and he's huge and our lives are to be lived in him. And uh, we don't know how to do that. But even the thought that we don't know how to do that 
can bring fear, but we don't even have to fear because he, he is, he says, I am your truth. I am your way. I am your life. And he leads us through how to do it. Now I want to get to a testimony that you have of you getting sick, you getting really sick after you shared a testimony of you having an abortion before you met Jesus. So could you just touch on that right there? Sure. Um, I had, uh, I had three abortions and, um, before I, um, uh, before, during that time I was away from the Lord and, uh, I didn't even remember I had three. I only remember two, but the Lord had to remind me there were three. And then I had very, very big memory of the second one, but, um, it's crazy how God works, but yeah, I had, I had just been through this amazing time of redemption from my abortions and healing. Um, and it's a testimony that I, I like to share because I, I feel like the opportunity for my babies that I boarded to have a crown to cast at Jesus' feet was taken from them. But whenever I share the testimony of how God redeemed me, I feel like in a way that's the only opportunity they have of casting a crown before his feet. And so I, I try to share their testimony as much as possible. And so I thank you for bringing that up. And so, but when I had just been through redemption and healing from that, and sharing openly with my church, which was an amazing uh, opportunity that they gave me um, to share that when all of a sudden it was like, uh, I, I went into this time of really, really intense physical testing. And it started with a stroke. I had a stroke. Um, I, had, I shared my testimony publicly for the first time on my birthday, November the 13th in 2013, and I had a stroke that May 1st, and, um, and when I had the stroke, I thought, oh, I'm just, you know, it wasn't too, too bad, but I thought I'm just going to recover from this and my life will go back to normal, but it never really did because um, within 10 days of having my stroke, I had um, two near fatal pulmonary embolisms that nearly took my life. And, um, and then I spent the next five years of completely just in and out of the hospital, um, all kinds of illnesses. And it turns out I had a heart defect and a blood clotting disorder. And so my body was just producing blood clots that were landing in my lungs and going through my heart into my brain. And they had a hard time figuring that out, but that's what was happening. But that's what was happening physically, but spiritually what was happening to me during the time of weakness is the Lord was just showing me, giving me rest. He was teaching me how to rest in him. Uh, a lot, I didn't realize I had a lot of anxieties about my children, about my marriage. I still had a, a big sense of insecurity about who I was to the Lord. And I felt like I had to run so hard to make up for all the time I lost. Uh, not following him, not knowing him. And he was showing me during this time of illness that Rhonda, I love you. And if all you can do is lay here and breathe, knowing that you knowing I love you and that I came for you and I saved you is enough. And he was showing me that I'm not worthy because of anything that I've done or anything I could ever do, but I'm worthy because of his blood and because of his grace towards me. And that is the only thing that's needed to worship him. And there's nothing I could do about the time I missed with him. He covered it with his blood at the cross. And there's nothing I could do in the future to do to earn him because he already paid the price. But then I could just belong to him. And that's all he really wanted. So spiritually, he was showing me that during that time. Oh, that's beautiful. Now I have a question for you. During this attack, did it stop you? I mean, because I know like you still battle some of these health issues right now. Mm -hmm. Has it stopped you from doing the will of God? Has it stopped you from sharing your testimonies? Well, obviously not because you're doing it right now, but has it stopped, <laughs> has it stopped in the sense of you sharing uh, your testimony of uh, the abortions oh. that you had and all that stuff? I, during the time after, even when I was in and out of the hospital, I was still leading abortion recovery groups. I really knew, and this goes back to the prayer, like there's no way I could go in there and do that 
unless there were people praying because prayer is really the battlefield that you have to break through. And, and when you start, you're fine as long as you just trust Jesus and live your life and say, I trust you, God, that you keep living the way you've been living. But when you go into and you try and take ground back that the enemy had in your life, you better have some prayer covering because he does not want to give that ground up. And it's a battle and it's a battle that we can't win. But Jesus has won, but we have to by stand truly and stand in his blood and make sure we're completely standing and rooted and grounded in him when we go to take that ground. And so that issue, that ground of abortion is a, is a real one where there was a lot of warfare. And so we, I learned really how to pray through going, helping other women go through abortion recovery. And so, and I did that, the, the other woman that I, I led the class with, she experienced health battles too. Um, and, and, and we learned we have to pray during to, to get the victory here. So we saw amazing victory, but also um, unless we, we learned how to pray seriously and during that time. So there was also, I published my first Bible study, my only Bible study that I have out now. I have others that I haven't published yet, but during this time. And it was so, it was kind of funny because at the time where I should have been like, you know, according to the world, like getting out there, self-promoting this study, I couldn't because I was in the hospital and I was, um, you know, learning how to um, walk with the Lord. And it's funny because the name of that Bible study is called Becoming You, E-W-E. And it's all about Psalm 23 and how to follow the Good Shepherd. But I like to, I, it's funny now because I like to say I, t I wrote the test and then the Lord said, now you're going to take the test. <laughs> And so because I went through the circumstances where I literally had to trust him to be my shepherd. And that's probably to answer your question, that's probably what I'm learned, what I've learned and am still learning about serving Jesus is that the world and even the church will say, this is what it looks like. Do, 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 do. And, but Jesus, we don't know really what it looks like because he alone made us, he knows the plans he has for us, but we may not know those plans. So we have to just grab onto his hand and let him walk us through the journey. And so, and he get and he determines what the plan is and he determines the results of that plan. And so I am, I've never stopped being used by him, but I would say that the view I had of what that looks like is completely different than what I thought it would look like. And so, whereas I thought it looked like pleasing God to reach as many people as possible and share his word as much as possible. What he's showing me is that my plan for you is me, myself. And so when you walk with me and you know me, my plan is that you be conformed to me and I alone know how to do that. But as you walk in conforming your life to my life, I'm, you have no idea how I'm going to use you along the way. And so that's kind of what it's looked like. And so there's been countless ways that he's used me and I continue to share the testimony of what he's doing. And that's kind of what perfect mess is all about. Let's talk about your health condition. Now, had you ever had any heart issues or blood clotting issues before this? No, I never did. Um, not that I, I've had, I was having some random, um, like, neurological well we realize now I was having tiny strokes but I didn't know that um my health never and I thought I was super healthy um before my stroke in fact I had just run my first half marathon that November and um so I was very healthy um other than the neurological things that now make sense in light of what we know now but I've continued to have some health struggles I have a pacemaker um, right here. And so I, I, I like to think that God has me on a leash, like <laughs> with my heart. And, um, and so that he's teaching me to live according to his pace and not, not my own. And so, um, but my health is really amazing. I have, um, this, this past, um, I guess uh, it's been over a year now. I was diagnosed with a terminal lung condition and, um, I was just like, what? That doesn't even make sense because it was at a time where I had just experienced so much victory with my health and really felt like I was gaining ground and recover, making a, almost as, as close to a full recovery as I could from my stroke and my blood clotting disorders. 
And all of a sudden my heart went into AFib and I started having all this trouble breathing. Um, and so I was, I was so confused and kind of, I'm like, really Lord, you know, <laughs> what's going on? And then to find out that it was the condition I was diagnosed with was terminal. I was, I mean, I, I was really, really, um, surprised and, and pretty devastated yet because of the journey I'd had with the Lord already and seeing him overcome so much in my health and in my life, I knew like, mm, he's up to something here. And so, <laughs> and so I didn't know what, and I would, to be honest, I was okay. Like, even if it was terminal and if I, if my life were winding down up to this point, I've, I've lived through some pretty, pretty, uh, awesome, uh, health trials and so I feel like every day is just a blessing that I get to keep here longer and loving him longer and loving other people longer and so but with when that happened with my lungs I felt like he was really just like teaching me like Rhonda you know what you need to do is really get rooted and grounded in my word and and watch and see what I will do and so that's what I did I went back into prayer and he would in uh, it's kind of crazy because when I had been walking with him a while and I was, um, I had this routine, like I get up in the morning and I, I pray and spend time with Jesus and the word. And, and then I get up and get about my day and, you know, continue to worship and pray throughout the day and whatever, however he leads me. But he was showing me that I kind of made a routine out of my routine. And he was kind of allowed this through this circumstance in my lungs. He was, he was getting me back into a new place, digging deeper ground in me. And he would tell me things like, get out and go for a walk. And, and that was by faith because I could not walk very far because I was having a lot of trouble breathing. But as I would start walking, he would put scriptures on my mind, like um, uh, Psalm 103, you know, bless the Lord, oh my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. And before I knew it, I was walking farther than I knew I could. And I was, his joy was becoming my strength and bubbling up in me. And I would be, you know, going, um, you know, maybe a mile or two. And I was like, in my, and I, I would just keep, he would pop up another song in my heart and I would just keep reciting these psalms and worshiping him and walking and doing things that I couldn't do um, physically. And then I would pray and say, God, like, what's going on with my lungs? And he, he would show me and he directed me on which doctor to go to. There was a time I was possibly going to need it. We thought maybe a lung transplant. So I was going to see a doctor about possibly getting a lung transplant. And he very clearly said, no, that's not the one I have for you. And at this time, this was during COVID. So it was very hard to get in to see a lung doctor. But there was one doctor that three people told me about. And whenever I hear something three times that I've been praying about, I feel like that's kind of God saying, this is where I'm leading you. And so, um, so when this one doctor I contacted that I couldn't see him for three months, which was a long wait when you're thinking, you're finding out if you're really going to live or die. And so, um, but, and, and I never, I could call all the time and try to get it sooner and I never could. So I had to wait that whole three months out by faith and I canceled my appointment with the lung transplant doctor. And when I went to see this doctor, um, he informed me that, yes, I do have technically the, the title of this lung condition, but that he was able to treat it be, based on some of the um, inform, other information that he had and that I have the only very small percentage of a treatable type of this condition so that I could live indefinitely even with this condition. And so since then, I, my health has been like even more improving as I, um, he's just, I'm just listening to the Lord and he's directing my steps and, and helping me learn how to cooperate with his word as well as with my body to get, to gain the victory over, over this. And so, and in, in, in the, this, he said in my weakness and your weakness, he is strong. And so that's definitely been the case because through this time where I'm, I'm really having to battle some of my diet bad choices and places where I've been undisciplined. They just like not letting me get away with myself anymore through this lung condition. So in, in my weakness, he is definitely becoming even more stronger than he's ever been. During your harder times mm -hmm. and, and your health issues at the time, mm -hmm. 
you had a near-death experience slash out-of-body experience. Yes. Tell us what happened. Well, this was when I had the, the pulmonary embolisms. This was right after my stroke. And what happened was <clears throat> I was, <laughs> I was, I just gotten out of the hospital from my stroke and I was feeling a lot better. Um, but man, sometimes when it rains, it really pours. And so while I was in the hospital from my stroke, our house flooded and um, a pipe overflowed into one of our kids' rooms. And so my husband was in there pulling up the carpet, trying to clean out everything. Um, I, my neighbors next door had two little boys that I used to babysit all the time. Uh, just, um, we were really close with our neighbors. And so um, I was over there babysitting um, her little guys, but I was having trouble breathing, which I didn't think was that unusual since I just had a stroke and I was on all this new medication. But um, slowly and steadily, it kept getting worse. And I did not want to tell my husband because he was already going under so much stress with the flood that happened and my stroke that happened and not being able to work and all of these things were hovering over him. And so I knew he was stressed out and I didn't want to stress him more. But so I thought I would call the nurse hotline from the hospital and without him knowing. And when I called, they were like, you can, you're having trouble even talking. We're either going to send an ambulance or you need to head over here right now. And so um, I had my, uh, I called my daughters um, and they got the neighbors to come home. And then my husband, had, at this time, I was so weak. Um, he picked me up and put me in the truck and we were headed to the emergency room. So we're on our way to the emergency room. And at this time we lived, um, it is, we lived kind of close to the coast. And so there was this bridge that you go over when you're about, it was right, the hospital was on the other side. And, um, and so while we're driving, I can't talk. I had like completely losing, it felt like the life, it felt like a, like a bottle of water that had a hole in it. And then just, but the life was like leaking out of me. And so starting from my feet, I lost all feeling in my feet and my legs. And it was almost like the feeling was leaving and the life was leaving my body from the bottom up. And it got to where I was, I couldn't even hardly, I was just so concentrated, just on trying to take a breath, just like, I couldn't do that. I, I felt like I could maybe just barely take a breath. Um, and, and, and it's so weird. It's the weirdest thing because breathing is so easy. Like we don't even think about it. <laughs> and so, and, um, but to all of a sudden I was just having to think like all my concentration into breathing and, and, and these thoughts coming through my head were like, Oh my goodness. Like I have always been having this ability to breathe but I can't do that right now. <laughs> and so, um, and it also occurred to me, like breath is a gift from God and it's his and he can take it back when he wants it. And it felt to me like that's what was happening. Like I suddenly realized, oh my gosh, I'm dying. Like, and I said that to my husband and it got to about here where I couldn't even feel my face anymore. I couldn't feel anything. And I just, I remember saying I'm dying. And all of a sudden, I became aware I didn't need to breathe anymore. Um, and I looked over, granted, I could not move. I couldn't move any part of my body because I was completely unconscious at this point. And I, I went like this and looked over out the window and we were headed over the, the um, causeway at that point. And so there's, I looked over and I just saw the wa this water, but it wasn't like the water that is there normally. It's like, it was like a beautiful and like birds. It was like the whole world just suddenly were completely different. Like the world looked like completely alive. Like everything was moving and alive. And the water had these light, it looked like the light was dancing and like it was everywhere. It was almost like, how in the world have I never noticed how beautiful the world is? And it, and there was complete peace. There was just this joy and light and life everywhere. And I could feel my arms going up like this. And, and I could feel a hand right here on my head, like lifting me up and my arms are going up and I knew I was about to go up. And, um, and that was, 
the next thing I remember, we were, uh, I, I was suddenly hit in the chest really hard and I startled awake and it was like, all at once I felt the weight back on me and I felt unable to breathe again. And what had happened is the, there were nurses and doctors that surrounded me and my husband had dropped me off and they were doing something to my chest and yelling at me, trying to keep me uh, awake from, um, I had been unconscious and they were t telling me to stay awake. And so, um, anyway, that's, that was that experience. And so I believe that was a near death experience, but not, not a full one. I didn't ever go to heaven or anything like that. Did you feel yourself leave your body? I did. I never, I don't think I left my body. I think I was still in my body, but my spirit was, I would, cause I looked over at the, and I was still felt like I was in the car moving, but I could, the vision I saw, I, my body was completely slumped over in the truck, like, um, completely unconscious. And according to my husband, but I remember looking up and looking around and, uh, so I don't know, maybe I didn't know what was going on. I didn't at the time, whenever that happened, I remember um feeling like it didn't dawn on me that the only thing I remember thinking is I don't need to breathe like I don't need to breathe like I don't remember ha having this need to breathe all of a sudden I didn't I had one minute I was like completely could not breathe at all and I was so concentrated on just breathing and then the next moment I didn't need to breathe and the whole world looked completely different and so I feel like maybe what happened was I, I went unconscious and I was very close to death, but I hadn't quite left my body. Mm, and I well, didn't know I need, I didn't know I should. I was like just traveling along. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure exactly, but that's all I know that happened. So you said your husband said that you were unconscious. So your eyes were closed, right? Yeah, my eyes were closed and I was I was slumped over in the truck and I had lost completely all strength and feeling in my body. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's as if like the veil was taken off and you saw the beauty of how God intended the earth. I don't know. It just, it just sounds so beautiful to me. It was amazing to look out and just see like, wow, this world is so beautiful. I remember saying, how in the world did I ever not see this before? And so to me, I didn't know that I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't even, I wasn't thinking about anything that had just been happening. I was just like, wow, all of a sudden I feel amazing and I feel uh, great and the world is beautiful. And I wasn't worried about my kids or my husband. I wasn't worried about anything because I was just taking everything in and the beauty of everything I was seeing. So you had no idea that you were even unconscious. It was just that you were no, sick. I didn't. All of a sudden, I was just super conscious <laughs> and super aware of how beautiful God's creation is. And I could feel him. I was aware that his hand was right here beneath my head. And I was like reaching up. And that, that was the last thing before I felt them pushing on my chest. And yeah, I felt like a big pain, like a weight in my chest. And then when I woke, they were a bunch of people yelling at me. I was very distraught. Wow. And I also knew, was very aware that I had, um, uh, had gone to the bathroom on myself. You know what? That's almost a sign of death though. I mean, like usually that happens when a person dies, right? Yeah, I had lost control there. And uh, so I, I was like, golly, how humiliating. <laughs> Oh, well, they see it all the time in the hospital. It was, it was yeah. no shocker for them. Yeah, definitely. That does sound like a near death experience. Mm -hmm. So from all this, from your whole life and from your whole life's testimony, you created a website called perfectmess.org. Tell us why'd you name it perfect mess and what's it about? And um, I called it that because the, the idea of perfect mess just came to me, um, from the Lord also when I, it was right it was after I had my stroke and I was in and out of the hospital I had been a bible study teacher to a group of women um all kinds of women but a lot of them were you know had dealt, dealt with brokenness and confusion stuff that I had been through and um I was a real mentor to them and, and they 
they don't realize it, but they were real mentors to me too. And, um, but anyway, there was a group of girls, young girls that came to see me um, one day in the hospital. And I remember being so embarrassed because I was so weak at that moment. And my physical therapist came right at the same time they came. And I could kind of fake being like that, you know, there I go struggling with that mask again, like looking like I have it together when I completely did not have it together. I was, I was a complete mess, but I just was trying to act like I wasn't like, which is something we do in this world a lot. <laughs> and so, um, I was, I was really embarrassed because I didn't want to do physical therapy with them there, but I also didn't want, I couldn't turn down physical therapy because that was part of what I had to do in order to go home one day. And so um, I had to do physical therapy with them there and they were able to see how weak I was. Um, and that was really humbling to me and just embarrassing. And so when they left, I was just really upset and I wasn't quite sure why I was so upset, but I was just praying to God and saying, why did, you know, why is this happening? Like, I'm, I'm embarrassed of how I am right now. And um, he was just showing me, Rhonda, you're, you, I know you, he was in my heart. He was just saying, you, I know you feel like a mess, but you're not a mess. I was a mess at the cross. I was a mess at the cross and I became a perfect mess. So you can know that I love you, even though you're, you feel like this mess you are right now, but my perfect love is covering over whatever weakness you feel right now. And so don't be afraid of this. Don't be afraid of who you are in me. And that never left me. And, and the, the scripture, I think that that personifies that is um, 1 John 1, 7 that says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have this fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And when I think about that, I think about there's these amazing three ingredients that we have, which is we have to walk in the light, which is seeing the truth about ourselves that, yeah, we are messy. We're, we walk through a world that is very broken and we are very broken sometimes in response to it, but that blood is there and nothing is more messy than what he became at the cross and blood is messy, but yet blood is what he used to draw, to, to redeem our lives to him who is perfect. And so even so we're free to walk in the light and see the truth about ourselves, even though it's messy, because because in, we need the we're all standing in the same blood. And because of that, we're not afraid of the light. We're afraid. We're not afraid to look at each other and to see the truth about ourselves, because we know we're all on equal standing because we all need the blood. And so we can look at each other and say, wow, you're you're so beautiful in Jesus and you're not who you, the mess that you think you are right now because the blood of his perfection is covering over you and there's a safety that we can be vulnerable and free with each other in that and that is that's why I called the perfect it's kind of like a play on words because there's a perfect mess that our lives can look like but yet that mess is often driving us into the perfect the perfect um, love of Christ who became a complete perfect mess of the cross on our behalf. Amen. And I like that. I like how you told me earlier how Jesus told you that he became a perfect mess for us on the cross. Yeah. So you confirm the name of it, your, uh, your website and your ministry. Mm -hmm. Rhonda, thank you so much. I'm asking you to pray for those who are feeling like they're a perfect mess right now and those who may be going through health issues like you've experienced, yeah. and those who want the wonderful experiences, the supernatural experiences that you had and, or, and, and still have, and the just fellowship with God. Can you just pray for those who long yeah. for that? Because there are a lot of people who want supernatural experiences, but are feeling like, I want what they have, but how come I'm not? I'm praying for it, I'm asking for it, and I'm not getting it. So could yeah. you just pray for those who are feeling this way? I would love to pray for that. Thank you, um, Jesus. I just thank you for this opportunity to come to fellowship with you and um, in your light, Lord. Um, I know sometimes we we look at people that maybe we look at we look at people and we think you're using them or you're talking to them in ways that 
that you're not you're not responding to me in that way and Lord that you we often forget that you are perfect and your love for us is perfect and and the fact that we even could think that is is really a, a highlighter to our own unbelief that that you love us you love us with your perfect love no matter where we are no matter what we're going through and so i just i think that the miracle is sometimes the supernatural miracle is that we can even have access to you that we can we can approach your throne of grace Lord. and so i'm asking right now on behalf of all of these right now who are where i've been we're just in a, in a, a time of weakness and lord i'm, I'm sharing the highlights of, of the of a very long journey with you many days down in the valley where I had no idea how I was going to get out of breathe and keep moving and breathing through the next moment. And father, there are, there's so many out there where I've been and they don't know how they're going to get through the next moment. And so I just pray right now that you would just baptize them in your love, that they would be willing to step into the light and say, this is the truth, Jesus, of where I am. And just, I pray that you give them the faith to step into the blood and let them be seen and loved by you. And that in itself is a supernatural encounter. Your love is supernatural. Your peace is the greatest miracle we can experience in this world. And so I just pray that you would baptize them in your peace. I pray that you would bring healing where healing is needed. That you would just show each of us that you're making an amazing story. You're writing an amazing story. And every tear is noticed. Every journey is noticed. Every time that we step outside of our, ourselves and say, Jesus, I'm here. I'm here and I need you. That you meet us there. Because you are so real and you're so good. And so I just pray that you meet every single person who hears this and sees this right where they're at, no matter how big a mess, Lord, your grace and your love is greater than whatever we're going through. And I thank you that you make our, all of our stories count. I thank you for the opportunity to share this testimony and it has nothing to do with me. It's all of what you've done, Lord, and all of what you're continuing to do. And I pray that you will can meet uh, each person where they're at and let their story be even greater, Lord. We love you and we praise you and ask all this in your name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rhonda, for sharing your testimony. You're welcome. It was my pleasure and my honor.